Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and welcome back for the second day of our, of our conference on the liberal state and its alternatives in the Indian Ocean world. Fascinating day of discussions yesterday and we definitely hope that that will continue today. We have an excellent uh, lineup of, of, of speakers uh, here with us today and this morning uh, we'll be tackling a neoliberal development and its alternatives. As you will see from your program, this is one of the only panels uh, that is intact from the way it was originally uh, set up to be, so all our, our speakers managed to, uh, to make it here and to, uh, to come out. Um, I'll introduce them in, in, in just a second, uh, but of course what this panel, above all, uh, aims to do is to explore how some of the political economic dynamics in the Indian Ocean world and perhaps beyond are changing. Yesterday we spoke a lot, of course, about identity and identity politics and different conceptions of order at the local level, at the national level, at the international level. Today we'll continue some of these conversations, but we'll try to, to add on to this a hard material edge of the, uh, of the changing uh, uh, political economy. And we have a very wide-ranging panel with people with all kinds of different uh, disciplinary and geographic um, expertise. Uh, we have, of course, uh, we first up here, uh, Prana Burden of University of California at Berkeley, who'll be talking in comparative perspective about China and India and the political economy of governance. Uh, then, of course, we'll, we'll listen to uh, Chua Benghuat of the National University of, of Singapore, who will be talking about the fascinating case study that is Singapore, and up to what extent there is something like a Singapore model, up to what extent Singapore is exceptional. As many of you will know, Singapore, or the Singapore example, is very often referenced uh, in the African uh, context in particular by some illiberal state builders, so it will be fascinating to get some, uh, some thoughts from Singapore. Then we'll have Ricardo Soares de Oliveira of the University of Oxford, who will be talking about the political economy of natural resources and the management and governance of natural resources, making a big macro comparison between South Asia and, and Africa. Uh, and, and last but not least, we'll have Lamia Karim of Oregon University, who will add a, a very strong gender uh, uh, lens and component to this by looking at neoliberal development and its alternatives in the Bangladeshi uh, context. Uh, we have about an hour and 45 minutes for these four excellent speakers. As yesterday, each of the speakers will speak for about uh, 15 minutes with their opening remarks, and then we'll open it up for, for questions and answer after that. But without further ado, Pranab, the floor is, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, and thank you, Harry. Um, I should tell you that um, when I was originally invited by Harry and Anatole, uh, I thought that I'm most inappropriate for this conference. Uh, I know very little about geopolitics or strategic or diplomat uh, diplomacy, um, but then they persuaded me that if I talk about governance, it should be all right. So with their indulgence, here I am talking about governance. Um, in the Indian Ocean area, I know a little bit about South Asia, but not so much about the other areas, but even within South Asia, I would be primarily talking about India. Um, before I talk and mention a few things about comparative governance of, of India compared to China, let me make some remarks, introductory remarks, uh, about my a little bit sense of discomfort about the theme of this session. Uh, and also a little bit of, about the write-up in the concept note um, about the neoliberal state. Uh, actually, I have always some difficulty with the expression neoliberal. I find different people mean different things by neoliberal. Uh, so sometimes I find it easier if you come out and openly uh, say what you exactly mean by neoliberal. For example, uh, Many people, I find, mean by neoliberal uh, market fundamentalism. If that is the meaning, then I don't know. Most countries in the world are not market fundamentalists, most, including United States or UK or European countries, and certainly not any of the countries I can think of in South Asia who fit the category of market fundamentalism. Uh, you can, of course, mean in, in a more wider sense uh, and I find some people use neoliberal to say pro-capitalist. If that is so, openly say so, say pro-capitalist, then it's easier for me to understand. Now, even there, uh, we have, of course, very few parts of the world which do not have a pro-capitalist development, uh, with probably the exception of North Korea, Cuba, et cetera, but uh, 
in this region in South Asia, yes, we have pro-capitalist development encouraged, but along with a substantial effort of, of welfare, it's welfare capitalism, um, substantial attempts to do something about the poor, to reconcile them with the instability and inequalities of capitalism. So again, it's not untrammeled capitalism, but it's of course pro-capitalist development. There's another distinction I think some people do not make. Take the example of the, of the Indian, uh, current Indian regime of Mr. Modi. To me, Mr. Modi is, uh, uh, the economic policy is business friendly, but not necessarily market friendly. This distinction between business friendly and market friendly is often, I find, missing in the critique of neoliberalism. Uh, so things like that sometimes make me somewhat uncomfortable without further uh, elaboration on the idea of, uh, of uh, neoliberal development. In South Asia, capitalism is still very, very weak. Most of the production is petty production. Will not be, in fact, a, a large part of it is the informal sector, a very significant, a substantial part, uh, will not be, will not, uh, will not be, can, cannot be defined by the standard criteria of capitalism. But there's no doubt there have been market reform, pro market reform. What we had previously, an over regulatory state, and the state had public monopoly in certain sectors and so on, that has declined, sure. But again, that's too restricted in mainly to trade policy and industrial policy. Agriculture sector in India, for example, to this day is heavily restricted um, and so on. So again, these things have to be qualified. Yes, there's, there have been movement towards market. Uh, I would say that's a limited movement and limited to certain sectors. There are regula continue, there continue to be heavy regulations. They are weakly implemented, weakly or corruptly implemented uh, quite often. And many of the deregulations relate to product markets. They do not quite often extend to what economists call the factor markets, like land, labor, credit. So regulations are still quite heavy in these three sectors. Whether that's justified or not, that's a different issue. But uh, reforms have not gone uh, equally, uh, 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 symmetrically, in the factor markets, so-called factor markets. The major looming danger in the countries of South Asia, I would say, is not so much neoliberal development, is the uh, rise of a rampant right-wing majoritarian populism. And by majoritarianism, I'm referring to Hindu majoritarianism, Muslim majoritarianism, Sinhalese major majoritarianism, and so on. That, to me, is the real danger. And this, although it's called right-wing majoritarian, right-wing populism, this right-wing populism is not anti-state. In fact, quite often it's pro-state. They want the state to be proactive in certain spheres. You and I may not like those, uh, what they want the state to do, but it is not anti-state. That is something also one has to keep in mind, even though it is clearly right-wing. Let me now go on to issues of governance of India compared to China. Um, if, if you ask me what is the major constraint, from the economic development point of view, what is the major economic constraint for India? I'd say it's things relating to social and and physical infrastructure. By social infrastructure, I mean um, education, health, public health and sanitation. By physical infrastructure, I obviously mean um, roads, uh, railways, uh, power plants, uh, the power sector, uh, broadband, uh, internet access, and so on. Those are the physical infrastructures extremely deficient in South Asia and certainly in India. So if you think about why, and that's where the issue of governance comes in. South Asia in general 
in these matters of social and physical infrastructure, the state is not very effective. So it's the lack of an effective state, which is, I think is extremely important. And there too, let me make a qualification. Looking at India, the state is actually very effective in certain matters, which I would call episodic matters, like in carrying out the logistics of the world's largest election. It's people underestimate in the rest of the world what an enormous logistic operation that is. And that's done pretty effectively. So India's state is very effective in that episodic matter, matter of carrying out the world's largest election, carrying out the world's second largest census, carrying out uh, uh, or uh, managing some of the world's largest religious festivals. Again, don't underestimate. In a certain week, in one ramshackle North Indian city, 20 million people suddenly descend. And it's managed relatively well uh, on a Hindu uh, religious occasion. So to me, the important thing is at the same time, on some day-to-day -day things, let me give you an example. The day-to-day -day running of a, a cost-effective electricity distribution. Electricity is a key input to the economy. India is a miserable failure. And that not because state capacity, basic state capacity is lacking. India has sufficient number of administratively capable people even in those sectors. But it's not just administrative capability. Quite often I see the discussion state capacity concentrates on administrative capacity. To me, why does the electricity sector have that problem? Enormous, it's a, it's a nexus between criminals, politicians, enormous amount of electricity is theft that goes on every day in India. Some, by some estimate, 40%, 30 to 40% of electricity is stolen every day. And that's not because administratively capable people are not there. It's a whole, so it's not so much administrative capacity, it's a political capacity. And that political capacity brings me to something that I think is a much more general issue in India. And this is what I would call a problem of collective action. And I've, uh, for many years, this, is, this has exercised me. Many, many years back, I gave, um, I wrote a book on political economy of development in India. The main issue is this. India, for some inherent structural reasons, have very low capacity for collective action. Something to do with um, the enormous diversity and conflict-ridden nature of society. So it's very difficult in India to, first of all, make up our mind in what should be done, given a particular problem. And once if we, we agree, that itself is difficult, but even if we agree what should be done to get our act together, which is uh, an easier way of saying what we mean by problem of collective action. So for example, in long-term decision making, and this is where the Chinese case uh, is much superior to that of India. Chinese solved their pr problems of collective action. Here is another large country, but much less heterogeneous, much less conflict-ridden. They resolved their problems of collective action much better than India. So in India, quite often, long-term decision-making gets hampered by this inability to solve, resolve the collective action problem. So instead, what you do, you fritter your energies and resources in short-term <laughs> solutions, short-term band-aid solutions or short-term subsidies, handouts, etc. With handouts, you placate different clamor clamoring groups. This was what my book was primarily about. So long-term public investment, like infrastructure, gets hampered, which is not a problem. And that's why in both social infrastructure and physical infrastructure, the Chinese have done much, much better. I have a short book came out three years back uh, as a paperback called On China and India. I think it's titled Awakening Giants, Feet of Clay. Uh, 
And essentially, in the largest chapter, the longest chapter, short book, longest chapter in that book is on governance. And I talk about, take different issues. But let me just give you one example from that book. Uh, if anyone is interested in more details, you can look up the book. Say, running of urban infrastructure in India. So compare two of the financial centers in the two countries. One is Mumbai and the other is Shanghai. And Shanghai has done a much better job in running of the urban infrastructure that is needed for running these huge metropolitan cities. And something to do with the governance structure. And I have a discussion. I'll come back to that in a minute in a slightly different connection. Um, some people think it has something to do with yesterday. The, the first panel was on uh, uh, Hebarian state. So some people say it's about strong state, weak state. China is a strong state. India is a weak state. Again, I don't find that distinction very useful. Um, yes, China is a very strong state. It takes bold, decisive actions very easily. India takes ages to, uh, to come to a decision, and even that decision will be uh, quite indifferently applied and so on. But in some sense, to me, the Chinese state is quite weak in a different ways. Sometimes policy formulation and implementation gets its, get their strength from by being politically contested and going through an elaborate process of deliberation and public reasoning. And that gives its legitimacy. The Chinese leadership derives its legitimacy from something else. For a long time, socialism is the glue. It's no longer. Nationalism is quite often used. I remember in around 200, I go to China quite often around 2008 when I was visiting. All of my friends, are very Chinese friends, were concerned growth rate will decline, and that was a big thing. So I, I joked and I said, if a growth rate declines to zero in India, nothing big will happen. Because Indian state does not derive its legitimacy from the growth rate. Whereas the Chinese leadership gets jittery if the stock market declines and tries to do something about fixing the. So here's a peculiar case, the Communist Party, the biggest communist party of the world, trying to fix the stock market. And then quite often failing miserably in that. So in general, I find the Chinese leadership, while it's very strong and quite competent, in taking bold decisions, it's quite often jumpy and jittery. Whenever there is even a smallest political shock or an economic shock or even a nature-made shock, um, they become jumpy. They immediately suppress information. They then, uh, inter uh, then come crashing down heavy-handedly. So to me, this is, whereas, most of my Chinese friends and Japanese friends, when they come to India, they, they can't believe their eyes how messy the whole thing is. And I tell them, our strength is in our messiness. As a result, we will bend but not break. Whereas the rimrod rigidity of the Chinese system ultimately is more fragile in my judgment. So in such, in such situations, how do you distinguish between a strong state and a weak state? A strong state may be strong in some respects, but may be fragile, particularly in terms of legit de the derivation of legitimacy. Some people then also talk about, quite often interchangeably, oh, uh, China is an authoritarian state, India is a democracy. Again, I find that too simplistic. Um, it's much more complex than that. India is an extremely flawed democracy. Indian elections are vigorous, but many of the democratic institutions are uh, are, are quite weak and, in fact, being eroded now under the current regime. Uh, whereas in the Chinese case, some of the strengths of governance have, have, do not have necessarily to do with authoritarianism. It's some Chinese, unique Chinese features, which I'm now next issue that I'm going to come to, unique Chinese features which sometimes have continued in Chinese history. So if Chinese were not authoritarian, those features probably will remain. Similarly, if India were not democratic, some of the problems of the governance structure will remain because inherently the collective action problem that I've, I've told you about will remain even if India were authoritarian. So 
I think one has to go beyond such simplistic statements about authoritarianism and democracy. Let me give you some examples of unique features of Chinese system, which India does not have. Um, one is, uh, just to give you a small example, if you look at the internal structure of government in China, the career incentives in bureaucracy. Now, for example, if you're a local official, your, your promotion depends on how does the, how has the local, uh, among other things, local economy, how, how, how it has done. So maybe you steal money, but you don't, you take care not to steal too much. Because if you steal too, mu too much, then the local economic performance will be affected, and that is given quite heavy weight in the formula for your promotion, apart from other things like local stability, uh, political stability and things like that. In India, the promotions are largely seniority-based. So you can loot. That does not affect your promotion chances as a local official. So career patterns and incentives are quite different. Uh, between the two countries. Of course, as I already said, you in Chinese official steals, but not as much. But there, of course, unlike in China, India has these checks and balances. Public scrutiny is stronger. There's a Right to Information Act. So all those act as a, as a, as a check on corruption. So it's not unlimited looting. Uh, but I'm just saying the bureaucratic structure, the incentive patterns in, in Korea, uh, is, is quite different between the two countries. Another thing that has struck me, and this is very little to do with authoritarianism in China. In China, again, in promotions of party officials, if you are a local official, and if you are lucky to have a mentor upstairs, say in the Politburo, then your chances of promotion are quite good. However, if under you, the local economy has not performed well, then, uh, then uh, chances are much, much uh, very poor. And this is now from a study that's been made of the career patterns of Chinese officials over the last two decades that I can cite if you, anyone is interested. So their conclusion is that, yes, there is patronage distribution, patronage given by the mentor in the top to the, to the um, and the, uh, to, to the client, uh, at the, uh, the client official uh, down, down, but loyalty is not enough. You need local performance. This is something which is not quite often missing in the Indian uh, bureaucratic promotions. In both countries, China and India, police and bureaucracy are heavily abused by the ruling party, but of course, more so in China than in India, because in India, the, the checks and balances of the uh, democratic system is there, independent judiciary, um, uh, pub media, public scrutiny is much stronger. So, uh, so the abuse of police and bureaucracy has some limits. With China, those limits are weaker. Let me now, I'm probably running out of my time, um, let me now, uh, come to the last point that I wanted to make. And that is a very interesting point that I find through, throughout Chinese history. China has a unique combination of political centralization with economic and administrative decentralization. So let me, last few minutes, let me uh, apply myself to that issue. Um, so, China, of course, because of, because of the all-powerful Communist Party and it's what is called the Organization Department, which is supreme in the appointments. Um, so, there is tremendous amount of political centralization, no doubt about that. At the same time, I'm surprised by the extent of economic decentralization, the local Authorities have so much power, which Indian local authorities cannot imagine. Going back to the Mumbai, Shanghai example. In Mumbai, of course, there are vigorous municipal elections. 
But the mayor, the elected mayor has very little power. Most of the major decisions, this is the financial capital of India. Most of the major decisions are not taken by the mayor of, of the municipality uh, involved. They are taken by an appointed official, I think he's called commissioner or something, a city commissioner, appointed from above. Similarly, in decisions about Mumbai infrastructure, which is in shambles compared to such a, uh, uh, the amount of wealth that is generated in Mumbai is enormous. Compared to that, the urban infrastructure is, is in shambles. So I have studied that. In fact, I, I've discussed this a little bit in my book on China and India. Correspondingly, compared to uh, Shanghai, it's not, it's not com comparable. So the f because the funding in Mumbai comes from above, not in, not in sufficient amounts because the electoral politics of Maharashtra, the sugar, uh, sugar farmers, uh, the sugar barons of the countryside are much, very powerful. So even though most of the wealth is generated in that, small, in that city, uh, there are other demands in the, in the politics. Whereas in the, in the Shanghai case, the way they raise their money and the way they spend the money and they manage the infrastructure is quite different. And they have a lot of power at the local level. Whereas in, in, the, in the, both the funding and the management of the infrastructure is, is much more, uh, the local people have very little power, comparatively speaking. So I think that, that kind of structural difference to me is very important. So I have noticed that throughout history, or I would say much peri long peri centuries in China, this pattern is there political centralization of the empire state earlier, imperial state, but a lot of local, in fact, earlier until 1994, tax reform in, in, in China, most of the local funding was collected, local taxes were collected by the local authorities and then given, sent above. 1994, there are some changes made. And in sending above, you hide things. Etc. The local authorities have a lot of power. There's no such power, no such corresponding thing in India. India is the opposite, almost the opposite. India has, I would say, compared to China, political decentralization. The regional centers have a lot of power in, 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 in India. But economic cent centralization and to some extent administrative centralization. So for example, for your, you may be elected locally, but you don't have any money. So you have to essentially have supplicants to the authorities above for the money. So you are economically powerless. So I'm calling it political decentralization, but economic centralization. Almost, not quite, I'm exaggerating a little bit, almost the opposite of China. Political centralization with a lot of economic decentralization. And this has tremendous effect on the economic uh, governance uh, structure. Just one more thing about decentralization and I'll be true. So when, if you go back to the 1978, uh, 79, when the Chinese carried out the economic reform in the 1980s, uh, the rural industrialization started under the TVE, the Township and Village um, uh, progr uh, program, TVE programs, etc. you will see that in other countries, this economic decentralization, even if it, you start it in India or in some other, other countries in South Asia or elsewhere, there's a tendency, and this is a problem of decentralization. Decentralization is a lot of things in favor, but one of the problems, one of the few, several problems is what I call local capture. So local interests captured. So in India, for a long time, even if you give power to the village council, local village councils, they will be dominated by the local landlords. Okay? The local elite will capture it. Why didn't it happen in China when China decentralized and gave in the rural industrialization? Well, I think this is quite often not noted. The 1978 decollectivization is not just decollectivization. It is one of history's most egalitarian distribution of land cultivation rights. Everybody had equal amount of land subject to some qualification for 
uh, size of the family, etc., is one of the most egalitarian distribution of land use rights, not ownership, but land use rights. So they're not big landlords to capture the local government compared to India. Okay? But the local capture has now become a problem in China too. This local capture is, in, in China, the local officials are quite often in collusion with the local commercial interests. And, and that is often behind the rise in inequality, toxic pollution, unsafe work conditions, uh, unsafe food product safety, uh, uh, and, uh, and so on. So local capture, uh, this collusion that I'm talking about, now becoming a problem in Chinese economic decentralization. That, let me just give you one piece of statistics. When I saw it, I couldn't believe. And then I checked, and it's true in other fields as well. So local officials are in collusion with local mining in interests. So one piece of statistics that I was going to tell you about is coal mine fatalities. I don't know how many of you know. Coal mine fatalities in China are more than 15 times, 15 times that in those in India. You might say China produces more coal than India. Yes, but even per unit, per ton of coal mined, the Chinese coal mine fatalities are three or I think it's three point something times. Why is it? It's because in India, the coal mine fatalities happen all the time. But tremendous furor. They'll be written in the press, the, the, the people, officials will be cross-examined and so on. Much less public scrutiny. So the local capture is now becoming a big problem within the, the Chinese system. So anyway, this is just to give you an example. Uh, I think the economic governance structure, the internal matters of internal organization of government is something that people do not pay enough attention to and, and they essentially end in with kind of superficial judgments. One is bureaucracy, uh, one is authoritarian, the other is democracy. I think one wants to go underneath those. The, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pranab. Benghuat, over you. to you. Thank you. Uh, how to explain Singapore? Uh, Okay, let me, let me start with a comment from a colleague of mine who's a sort of very seriously Marxist sociologist who said to me once that, he said, I will never go to Singapore. I say, why not? He said, it's because Singapore, an authoritarian government that works is a very dangerous idea. And he doesn't dare to go to Singapore because he might just get seduced by the fact that it works. Uh, I think that actually there's quite a lot of truth in that. What I want to do is end up in my 15 minutes to sort of make some adjustment to the term authoritarianism. But that Singapore that works uh, is what I'm trying to, what I will try to explain. I think one of the things that often forgotten when people visit Singapore, they see this you know, glossy capitalist economy, uh, totally modern city. But one need to remember that in fact, one of the reasons why it works so well is because the ruling party, the, the People's Action Party, started out life as a social democratic party that it was formed in the 1950s when social democracy was a viable idea. And it, was, it inherited this sort of authoritarian image because the Social Democratic Party was constituted by two political factions, one which is a professionally trained, English educated, university trained uh, group of professionals, including Lee Kuan Yew, who's a lawyer, Go King Sui, who's an economist trained at the LSE, and a couple of people, uh, journalists, biologists, and so on. And the other half is actually very poorly locally educated, left radical unionist who believes in uh, working for the people. So the two faction were sort of uncomfortably united under decolonization politics. 
And at a time when effectively the entire atmosphere generally was left leaning. And it's very interesting when Lee Kuan Yew first came into contact with the left wing, he was totally surprised by how dedicated these theoretical left unionists were in terms of uh, commitment to uplifting the conditions of what was then a very poor Singapore. And interestingly, they, all the English educators dropped all their bourgeois ways. They stopped smoking in public, they stopped drinking in public. Lee Kuan Yew had the first, one of the earliest Mercedes cars in Singapore, he stopped driving it. And uh, they started to realize that if they're gonna win the election, uh, they would have to be as ascetic as the radical left. Now remember, this was Cold War time period. So the repression was when the split between the two factions came. Essentially, the, the Lee Kuan Yew faction outmaneuvered the left, including putting many of them in jail for a very long term without trial. Uh, and this was, of course, not a problem because it's a Cold War and the West was encouraging repression anyway. So. Uh, and Singapore and the rest of Southeast Asia were the front line of the Cold War uh, against communism. So all of this was, did not pose any serious problem for the PAP government, for the Lee Kuan Yew government. Now, so Lee Kuan Yew, facts, I mean, equally because of the social democratic beginning was very anti-liberal. Uh, give you a story about him, he was, he was in, uh, he took a short break from government to go to Harvard and uh, for a supposedly sabbatical and Kissinger at the time was the, invited him to sit in on a seminar on the debate, on, to debate Vietnam, on the Vietnam War. And of course, the, all the Harvard professors were anti-Vietnam War. So when it came to time to ask Lee Kuan Yew what he thought, he stood up and say, I'm sick and tired of all of you liberals, and he walked out of the room. <laughs> so he has no love for liberals. The PAP government continue to have no love for liberals. Lee Sen Long, now the son of Lee Kuan Yew, actually said, you know, the PAP had never believed that liberalism was the ideological end of political development for the world. <clears throat> Very directly anti Fukuyama. So the repressive, so I think this history of repression uh, in the sort of nation building days get, is carried over uh, until today, which is the sort of question of Singapore's uh, authoritarianism. But one of the interesting thing is that really a party is not able to stay in power for 50 years and I expect that it will be another 20 years. I will probably not see a change of political party regime in Singapore in my lifetime. It will continue to be the way, it will continue to govern for at least the next 20 more years. But a party cannot stay in power for so long by just living on authoritarian repression alone. So what is in fact keeping uh, the party in power? One of the interesting thing is that even at the height of its, uh, of its power, I mean, Lee Kuan Yew had no love for elections. He hated elections. He actually said that if I don't have to face the electorate every five years, I'll probably do a better job governing Singapore. But be, so it implies that he does actually re realize that with, you know, election was a very important touchstone of legitimacy and that he has to put up with occasionally, if necessary, public opinion. Um, so election, but what, hap, what is interesting is that it turns the idea of election away from liberal understanding of representative government into what is probably, and I have to work this out, I mean, I have, I, my hunch is that into a kind of colonial inheritance because the British colonialism at certain point justifies its colonialism on the basis that it had only the right to govern or the right to colonize if as a colonizing power it was willing, if it was working in the best interest of the colonized. 
so that it sees itself as a trustee to safeguard the best interests of the government. And I, so the PAP government actually turned this notion of election into an idea of trusteeship in which election uh, to be elected it is to be entrusted to do what is best for the government and not to represent the narrow interests of the constituencies that elects you. So that it takes the notion that after the election, the winning party needs to declare that it will now govern in the best interest of the whole nation and not discriminate against the, those, those who voted you in favor of those who vote for you, right? Voted against you and vote for you. So, and I think this is a fairly interesting uh, shift of the democratic discourse because in, within the terms of democracy, you actually have to work between those two terms of representation uh, of interests and in governing as trustees. Right. So what does this translate in the best interest of the population of the, of the electorate translate into practical, uh, into sort of practical uh, policies? Let me time myself here. I want to only talk about two instances, two issues that I think are two of the really important uh, elements that continue from the 1950s till now. And they were foundational and continue to be fundamental to the legitimacy of the government. First, let me say that the elections continue and there are actually opposition parties by fairly ineffective to opposition parties. There are also consistently about 25% of the electorate that votes against the, the people's, ex, you know, against the PAP since 1954, or 15, since 1959. Okay, so there is actually a, a consistent, at the height of its popularity, it won about 75% of the popular vote. In Singapore, election is compulsory. And in 2011, its popularity, popular vote level sunk to 60%, and it worked really hard to regain the ground and regain, recover the uh, popular vote level to 70%. So those, so in a set, elections are manipulated to the advantage of the incumbent government, like heavy gerrymandering and so on. But generally, the votes, the voting system is is actually very clean. There are no violence during election time. Ballot boxes don't disappear. Uh, in the early days, some serious heavy opposition members, potential opposition members would probably be detained just before the election, but that's in the history of the authoritarianism. So, but in practical terms, one of the, I mean, the reason, to, uh, the, you know, one of the reasons why there's longevity of the government is precisely because it's economically extremely uh, successful, right? So what accounts for the successes? One of the first, one of the most important act of the, the social democracy of the PAP government is the nationalization of land. The government had an extremely draconian land acquisition law that allows it to acquire any piece of land, any private hold, land holding for what it claims to be the national development purposes. That, is, that remains sort of undefined, but one of the most important piece of uh, use of the national, so the government now owns 90% of the land uh, that comes from inheritance from the colonial government, uh, land reclamation, and compulsory uh, acquisition. A significant chunk of the land is acquired, nationalized land is in fact used for public housing. And public housing is a very important cornerstone of the legitimacy of the PAP government. In fact, 90% um, of the population now lived in government built subsidized housing. Um, I'll come to the importance of that. It, uh, the, 
the nationalization of land also allows for long-term planning of infrastructure. So the infrastructure system in Singapore, the basic plan had been in place since 1970s and it's been consistently carried out without any disruption. The ownership of land also is a source of revenue for the, nation, for the government because this is where the rentier part comes in, which it actually puzzles out land for lease to commercial development including development of what is called private condominiums. <clears throat> because the government controls all the public spaces, it also therefore, through that, control political, public political behavior in terms of assembly, uh, in terms of public assembly, and in terms of in demonstrations. But Singapore, with the public, the public housing authority, I mean, uh, program is practically universal provision. Right, the, the Housing and Development Board is the monopoly provider of housing for the entire nation. Currently about 90% of the people lived in 99 year leasehold public housing system. So it's publicly subsidized, but privately owned. You buy a 99 year lease, you have the rights to buy and sell that lease uh, the use of the unit, even if you don't own the land. So I think, you know, without doubt that the, I mean, the idea was to create a kind of state, the, the idea was to uh, create a kind of home owning democracy in terms of legal and use terms, because he think he argued that owning a stake in the, uh, own, own, that citizens need to have a stake in the nation in order for them to be uh, willing to uh, support the government uh, to, to, in order to be nationalistic. The second most important thing is actually within the whole capitalist development in Singapore is a very significant chunk of the economy is owned by the state. So there is a very strong capitalist state uh, uh, sector in which if you look at the Singapore Stock Exchange, almost all the big firms are started out as state-owned companies, corporatized, but still with state majority ownership. <clears throat> and it comes from, uh, there are different paths to developing state-owned enterprises, uh, which I won't have time to go into, but just to mention one, is all, this, all the uh, state services, to, uh, that all, this, all the public goods that the state has to provide, the state provide commercially, devise that provision into a commercial firm that provides the service and a regulatory body that controls the profit at home. But once the company is formed, the company is then free to seek opportunities, investment opportunities outside the country and become a multinational corporation. So the Singapore Telephone Company, for example, now derives 60% of its annual revenue from global overseas investments and 40% from home. So those who cannot afford the services will then be given a subvention by the state uh, to, to purchase the services. So in so doing, the government actually, actually owns a very large chunk of the economy and is now capital exporting. The companies are then grouped together, placed under a, a single holding company, which then aggregate the profit, forms a sovereign wealth fund, invest the money internationally. What is really interesting is that the annual profit of all the state-owned enterprises, 50% of the annual profit is now channeled into the national revenue. So there's a non-targeted social redistribution program that comes from government, comes from profit made by the government. The other 50% gets channeled back to grow the companies so the wealth of the nation is so, I mean, the, 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 the reserve is so deep that Singapore currency is extremely stable, even at the national, during the Asian financial crisis, Singapore currency was barely affected and was able to recover from the crisis within a year and has never suffered from any multilateral intervention into its economy. So, I, so right now, so currently then, the uh, government revenue constitutes somewhere around between 12 to 16 percent of the annual budget, depending on how well the business has run. What is interesting is this sort of uh, 
transition, you know, democratic transition theory people keep expecting Singapore to become more liberal democratic and keep wondering why is there an expanding middle class and still there is no middle class revolt against presumed authoritarianism. One of the interesting questions, one of the interesting reason is of course because the, the civil service, the state enterprises, and the services that service the state enterprises and the government constitute a large chunk of employment for the Singapore local middle class. So that there is in fact, if you will, a middle class elite coalition in the interest of the nation. So that you don't have the kind of rebelliousness or the kind of clamoring for uh, democratization as such. Now, the interesting thing is that as of now, there is no one in political detention except a few alleged uh, Islamic fundamentalists. And the reason is very simple because there is actually diminishing need for authoritarian repression in Singapore because the political party is genuinely popular because of its ability to, over the last 50 years, continuously uh, see upward mobility although the upper mobility is starting to slow down because stratification, uh, class stratification is starting to become much more uh, serious because of inheritance of advantages across generations. But in, in any case, the need for authoritarian repression has been sort of really minimal. Uh, and at the same time, the being in post-Cold War years, being now in the post-Cold War er era, the kind of repressive measures that Lee Kuan Yew was able to exercise would no longer be tolerated in the world. And Singapore cannot afford global sanctions or sanctions even from, uh, you know, uh, from uh, the West, like the way Myanmar was being sanctioned for 20 years, because Singapore economy would collapse with that kind of sanction. And so it is unable, even if they desire to, unable to exercise the same kind of authoritarian uh, repression. And increasingly, of course, the, the Singapore's presence in the international forum exceeds its size to, uh, in a tremendous extent. Uh, so the international reputation of Singapore is a symbolic capital that it cannot afford to waste, and waste it on jailing up a few ineffective dissidents. Just doesn't make sense. So that, I mean, as I said, I want to end at that point of sort of making some correction to the term authoritarianism, but um, the Singapore, the successful economy continues to be the case. I think even in the current global recession, it is still okay. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, it has been a pleasure to be here. Um, I had a very long paper with 11,000 words that I had to quickly strip down to about five pages um, and I will try my best to cover most of it. Um, so Bangladesh, um, which is where I do my uh, work it was considered a failed state in the 1980s. And it went on to become the heartland of the microfinance um, global movement uh, with the Grameen Bank winning the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize. And it also became the second largest apparel production country after China by the 2000s, overtaking both Vietnam and Sri Lanka. Today, over 20 million women are associated with microfinance activities and another 4 million are garment factory workers. Now, a particular feature of this development narrative is how poor women were brought into the economy to help the country attain its new image as a development success story. Um, my analysis of the Bangladeshi state departs from conventional notions of states as sovereign entities that have rights over their subjects, institutions, and territories, and we have discussed here. And we all know that that's uh, 
you know, it's a faulty uh, paradigm to begin with. But when I started doing my research in the late um, 1990s, I um, studied the NGO sector, and at that time, I conceptualized the NGO as a shadow state. And with, this is within quotes because those are not my terms, they are borrowed from other people who have studied um, NGOs. However, as I um, look at the Bangladeshi state today, I find that the relations between the state and the NGO sector has uh, transformed over time and the state is now much stronger than it was previously. So it went from a weak state dependent on NGOs uh, that were funded by, by Western development organizations to a new state where it is more authoritarian and less dependent on Western aid. As the other th uh, a couple of things that we should remember about Bangladesh is that it's the only South Asian country uh, that became independent after 1947 uh, from a nine month um, struggle against the Pakistani state, which was aided and abetted by the Indian state. So the formation of Bangladesh was an asset to the Indian state. To, for Bangladeshis, they will say, we went from being an internal uh, colony of Pakistan to an external colony of, Bangladesh, uh, of India. But what is also important to remember that the Bengali nationalist movement that began in 1952 uh, for the right of Bengalis to have uh, Bengali as the national uh, language, um, was ideationally a middle class uh, movement and it uh, did not address questions of agrarian social relations or the question of woman. What would be the role of this woman in the new state? The role of the woman in uh, the Bangladeshi independence uh, movement comes in through the figure of the sexually violated woman, the Birangana, the war he hero. Uh, and the state, uh, after 1971, did not make any attempts to socially and economically rehabilitate her. The other uh, woman that I do not want to forget is the indigenous woman in the Chittagong Hill Tracts or in the uh, you know, other parts of Bangladesh. But in uh, 1971, the first uh, prime minister of Bangladesh went to the Chittagong Hill Tracts and told the uh, indigenous people there that they should stop being indigenous and become Bengalis. And that led to a 20-year uh, uh, insurrection in that area. That said, let me turn to uh, you know, the main uh, part of my presentation today. The invisibility of women's labor in agriculture was first addressed by Esther Bosserup's seminal book, Women and Development, published in 1971, that challenged practitioners within the World Bank, United Nations, and international development agencies to come up with new models that included women as participants. The broad consensus was the inclusion of women in development projects. Thus, gender, meaning women, became the new norm in development work. The 1970s through the 1990s saw a series of initiatives that targeted women's issues at a global level. Policymakers and feminists working on women's issues advocated for the end of gender discrimination with the 1975 UN Decade for Women. Uh, the 1973 Percy Amendment in the US also required that all development projects included, include women as beneficiaries. Feminists have called this add and stir, method of empowering women. The development work around women in Bangladesh occurs at this intersection of global mandates in women and development work and World Bank initiated reforms around market liberalization that was not done fully or substantially, but in a series of staggered steps. Compared to Bangla India then, Bangladesh began with an early onset economic liberalization process from the 1975 under military dictatorship. It's also interesting to note that two economists in 1974 described Bangladesh as the test case for development. In their view, Bangladesh's importance lay open quotes, in its availability as a possible test case of opposing systems of development, collective and compulsory, cons compulsive methods on the one hand and the less fettered working of the private enterprise on the other. 
If the problem of Bangladesh can be solved, there can be reasonable confidence that less difficult problems of development can be solved elsewhere. Their assessment of the market model coincided with global trends of deregulation and economic liberalizations. The first government of Bangladesh adopted a socialist policy that nationalized the commercial banks, jute and textile mills. The Awami League government uh, rule was characterized by corruption, inefficiency, and lawlessness. Um, in 1975, um, the leader of the Awami League party, Sheikh Mujib, and his family members were assassinated in a military coup, and what followed was 15 years of military rule during which market reforms were introduced. By the 1990s, Bangladesh transitioned to democracy, and market reforms were ac accelerated even more. Two national parties have dominated um, the Bangladeshi state and um, Awami League and the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, the latter associated with the first military dictator, Zia. Female heads of, uh, we have had female heads of state um, since uh, democratization, but that does not mean that we have had any kind of a feminist um, agenda to bring uh, equality and emancipation to women. Um, the difference between these two parties is that Awami League is considered more secular in its ideology and aligned more with India, and the BNP as more Islamic and anti-Indian. Beyond that, the two political parties are similar in their promotion of free market ideology. So between 1975 to 1990, military rulers followed the roadmap of market reforms favored by Western industrialized nations. They also removed secularism from the constitution and made Islam the state religion, and they did a variety of other things. They implemented World Bank IMF structural adjustment policies and took measures to reduce the budget deficit, reform the public sector, withdraw subsidies on such items as food, fertilizer, and petroleum, and overall liberalize the trade regime. The first military uh, dictator also went on to say the state would never nationalize private sector enterprises. The military's main focus was on consolidating its urban base by building alliances with an emergent business elite class in Bangladesh. Unlike uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh did not have an industrial uh, bourgeoisie leading up to 71. So for example, uh, if you look at the 1971 national elections, you find that 28% um, of the newly elected members of parliament were industrialized industrialists and traders. So they began to build under uh, the sponsorship of the military rulers. Um, the military also um, transferred ownership of 60 jute and textile mills to the private sector. Uh, by 1981, you find that a third of industries were privately held. Then by 1985, another four years, almost 78% of all industries were in private hands. So it's a very rapid, accelerated growth. Um, if this was happening in the urban sector, what was happening in the rural sector? Well, Western development nations saw the newly formed Bangladeshi state in need of relief and rehabilitation. They wanted to bypass the military state that they saw as corrupt and turn to the fledgling NGOs. That was indigenized by this point as the sector to reach the rural population. Capitalizing on these Western mandates around WIDGAD, and also in order to get petrodollars, the military state introduced two incompatible forces into rural society. On the one hand, they supported the unfettered growth of the NGOs to work with rural women. And on the other, they encouraged the growth of the madrasas that had a different view of women's public roles. So when, by the time 1990s come and democratization happens and the military get, is removed and the space gets opened up, you begin to see a more um, you know, fragmented space where people are fighting over what will be the ideology of the state, what will the state look like. Um, so I see I have two, uh, five minutes, so I'm going to quickly uh, tell you a little bit about um, microfinance, um, and also the RMG. Um, 
Microfinance, uh, as you all know, became a, a donor, uh, I mean, a global mandate, and it's part of the um, Millennium Development uh, Goals, and that was because, and a lot of that research of why microfinance works was taken from Bangladesh. But my research showed that what microfinance was doing was it all, it was really creating a new relationship of inequality between uh, financially strapped borrowers and resource rich NGOs. And the NGOs in the 1980s and 1990s controlled two thirds of rural credit. It wasn't the state, it was the NGO. Why did the state do that? Well, as I mentioned, it, it was, uh, you know, it helped them to uh, consolidate their power in uh, the urban areas. Now to turn to the, um, RMG uh, sector, which also grew under military sponsorship, is that, and I think this ties in also with the I Indian Ocean area, is that in 1975, the multi-fiber um, MFA, fiber agreement, uh, didn't allow South Korea, Taiwan, China to have tariff-free access of their goods to EU and US markets. As a result of that, South Korean um, owners, um, factory owners relocated to Bangladesh and uh, they built uh, factories there and very soon uh, they were able to, uh, other uh, Bangladeshi uh, factory owners also emerged. So if you look at the Bangladeshi factory um, environment now, it has Chinese, Taiwanese, uh, Indian and Korean owners alongside Bangladeshi owners, but Bangladeshi owners uh, formed the majority. Um, the government also allowed this unfettered growth of the RMG sector. It uh, did not uh, monitor this uh, industry, allowed uh, illegally built factories uh, to be built uh, with, in violation of all uh, building safety codes. Uh, did not monitor um, labor laws, did not implement them, did and also allow trade unions and restricted the work of trade unions till up, up until 2013 when you know that the big industrial uh, accident occurred. Wages were really held down until uh, 2005. It was at $22 between, uh, and then it was raised to 30 and after 2013, it has been raised. Now, a couple of things. Uh, there are over four million women in this uh, industry. Um, they enter around the age of 15, they exit out by 35, so the work period is 20 years, and these women do not have a background in the former textile industries. They're very young women who have, are coming from rural areas due to the disinvestment in agriculture and high levels of poverty. But there's a radical transformation that's going on with the women coming into the public sphere, getting into wage labor, le you know, working, and also learning to demonstrate. So the idea that Bangladeshi uh, factory workers are abject subjects is not true. They work in abject conditions in which we are all complicit because we buy these products um, that they manufacture for very low wages. Um, and um, so, I have a couple of minutes to wrap up? Two minutes, yeah. Okay. So, uh, one of the things that um, I want to raise here, uh, two things. One is, why didn't the Western donors uh, ever really focus on the work of the women in the garment industry, because they focus very much on the microfinance industries the, and, and the mobilization of women as entrepreneurs in Bangladesh, whereas they never talked about the horrific conditions under which um, global retailers were having their clothes produced at very low cost by these young women working in horrific conditions. And I, I would argue that there was a kind of an complicit understanding that one, the women in the microfinance uh, story are the ones who are breaking Islamic patriarchy and women in this uh, RMG, ready-made garment factory, can be the hidden face of uh, also you know, a new kind of factory uh, capitalist patriarchy. One was spoken about, the other one was not. The second thing is what happens to Bangladesh 
after 2000, uh, late 2000, especially around 2010. Uh, you all know about the removal of Professor Yunus. I do not want to go in there. But what had be, has become clear under the uh, Awami League um, a political party that has uh, come to power uh, is that the state has become more author authoritarian. And a new relationship has developed between the state and the NGO, where they have moved into a far more adversarial position. The state will allow the NGO to work in development activities, but will not allow uh, NGOs to engage in any kind of political activities. And the WAMI League um, leader, Sheikh Hasina, was the first person who recognized, I would argue, that the NGOs over time had developed into a formidable political force outside of conventional political parties. And that was one of the reasons why she um, attacked Professor Yunus, among other things. The second thing is that, in terms of the Indian Ocean, is that Bangladesh, eh, the two main sources of uh, foreign revenue uh, for Bangladesh is through remittances. And as you know, we are here in Doha. And the second is uh, from the garment industry, which is at close to 30 billion now, um, and is three, four fifths of the uh, foreign earnings of the country. And Bangladesh has begun to also explore uh, for gas in the Bay of Bengal, and there are new trade ventures with China, Japan, and India. And so the state has begun to develop alternative revenue sources. It is not as dependent on foreign aid as it was in the 1970s and 80s, and um, it is sort of looking at uh, it's slightly diversifying its revenue sources. But uh, at the same time, uh, the authoritarianism of the state has had a stifling effect on free speech. Uh, within the country, there has been tremendous um, political persecution of dissidents. And of course, uh, you know, the issues around women's labor and uh, parity in terms of uh, wages, et cetera, are not being addressed. Thank you.